I or other folks <laughs> if either I or other folks have um, answers to questions people may have, but I'm going to start by I'm going to present some slides and um, feel free to I don't know if people have the um, raise your hand feature on here, but I'll, I'll check in throughout my presentation to see if there are questions on different sections, and then at the end we'll have time for questions too. Um, <clears throat> so I'm just going to uh, do my best to kind of tell you as much as I know for, you know, without going overboard, and then we'll see what um, what other questions there are. So thank you so much for being here. Um, let's see, I have to do this on here. Yes, okay, great. So the grassroots program is a program, as I said, with the Department of Neighborhood Development at the city of Boston. And the Department of Neighborhood Development is the city of Boston's affordable housing program, um, or affordable housing department. So you may be wondering why there's a program that has to do with open space, at the Department of Neighborhood Development. And the reason for that is that land that is taken into the city's inventory through tax foreclosure, or if it's um, what we call surplus land from other city departments, if the, uh, you know, there's a parcel that's in the inventory of the Boston Public Schools and they don't need it for any school usage, then they can transfer it to us. And then we are able to, and we attempt to um, dis distribute that land, dispose of it, we call it, um, basically take it from being in sort of general public hands into uh, the hands of organizations in the community, neighborhood groups in the community to turn into either open space or uh, affordable housing or other kinds of projects. And so the land that is often turned into community gardens in the city of Boston comes from the Department of Neighborhood Development. So I joined the department about two and a half years ago and I've been uh, working ever since to help people get access to city land, federal money, and technical assistance for open space projects. And most of the projects that I, that I help people do or that we help people do in this program is um, they're mostly food producing projects. So a lot of community gardens, also food forests, urban farms, and um, some other kinds of more passive open spaces. Um, we also do a lot of transfers to the Parks Department or the Conservation Commission, but most of the work is really helping people get access to land to start gardens and other food producing spaces and it's really great work and I really love it a lot. Um, so if you're wanting to start a community garden or a food forest, which is another way of, you know, increasing community food security. Um, and a lot of times we actually see combinations of community gardens and food forests. If you want to do that, these are kind of the two, four of the main parts of the process um, in Boston. Site selection, community engagement, land acquisition, and then funding. So I'm going to talk about each one of these step by step. So of course, there's, there's uh, multiple factors that go into finding a good site for a garden. And some of those have nothing to do with my department or my, you know, my program that I manage. Um, the sun and the shade is a factor. You want to make sure neighbors are excited to have a garden and we'll, we will talk a little bit more about that with community engagement. You want to make sure the landscape is good, like in terms of, um, it's really hard to start a garden on a very ledgy sloped parcel, but you, if you find something that's like nice and flat and in the sun and the neighbors are excited about it, that's a really good possible site for a community garden. Access to water is also a really big factor. Um, water connections are possible and we fund plenty of those um, through the city, but a much, there are much less expensive options, including rain catchment systems and submetering, which submetering, submetering, excuse me, means basically, oh, and I, I forgot to add one here actually, which is hydrants, but um, submetering means that you make an arrangement with the neighbor and you put a submeter on their water and then you just, you know, usually pipe, you know, use a hose and like take water from their, from their water connection, but then you're able to pay them and reimburse them for it. Um, there's also a device that the Boston Water and Sewer Commission uh, can make available to access water from hydrants. And that's also very inexpensive compared to having your own water connection. Um, but it's, you know, it's less readily available. Once, once the water connection set up, you can just, you know, turn on the water right there. You don't have to deal with the hydrant. Um, and the other major factor I would say is in terms of thinking about a site that you might want to start a new garden on is to, and this is what I always encourage people to do when they reach out to me um, about a certain site is to find out from us 
if there's already some process underway in the neighborhood for that site. So it might be that somebody else is already talking about putting a garden there, or somebody's talking about um, putting affordable housing there. The neighbors are in support of that. So it's important to, we, we really try to, we, we don't, we want people to pursue what they want to pursue and talk with neighbors and community members and organize, but we also don't want people to put in a lot of effort if, if we're sort of imminently about to, you know, fund affordable housing on a site um, that's already gone through a community process. So we just don't want people to like sort of waste their time. Um, and we, and I'm part of my role in the technical assistance piece of my job is to help people figure out if a site is a good fit. If it's something that um, besides these other factors about, is it a good place to grow food? The other question is, is it, um, a site that is not already, you know, about to be something else. Um, I see there's something in the chat. So I'm just gonna look and see if there's any questions already. Oh, that's right, yes. I was gonna say that actually. What is, someone asked, what is a food forest? A food forest is basically a little orchard. It's a, it's a public forest that is filled with fruit trees and fruit bushes, and sometimes also has um, raised beds that have, more annual type crops, but um, there's several food forests in Boston. There's one um, right near me on Geneva Ave near Fields Corner, and there's um, one on Ellington Street in Dorchester. There's at least one in JP. So a food forest is basically anyone, the community cultivates it and takes care of it, and anybody can come up and like pick an apple and eat it. Um, and it's meant to be that you sort of take what you need. Um, it's, not, it's not for anybody to be, you know, growing food to sell. Um, it's for really community food security purposes. So thank you for asking that question, Renee. Can I ask you a question? Sure. Uh, soil testing. Uh, if you're uh, breaking ground for a new community garden, uh, you wanna make sure what the lead content is or any other types of toxic uh, uh, substance are in the soil. Um, well, so I don't know if there was a question specifically about what we do, but we the we assume that any land in the city has lead in it, and so we don't we really expect and require that any gardens that get built on city land are done with either raised beds or by like excavating all the dirt and bringing new so soil in um, because of that problem. And we do we do do some testing. We do uh, what's called a phase one, which is an environmental review based on past history of the site and nearby sites. And then if there's any reason to think there might be even more toxins than just lead, um, then we, we may do testing depending on what the situation is or you know, depending on what the, the phase one reveals. Um, but we, we, don't, we, don't we don't generally test for lead because we assume that there is lead. And so we, uh, our, the, the best practices that we recommend are for people to put raised beds, whether it's like one giant raised bed or individual raised beds. So. Do you do? Do you have some kind of barrier between your raised bed and the uh, soil that's originally there? Well, I mean, we don't grow, we don't build the gardens ourselves, but we do um, encourage people to put a, like a barrier between, yes. Yeah. Great. Um, I see someone else says that. Well, I'm, I'm gonna come back to other, to comments and questions later, but I'll just, um, for now, I'm gonna keep going. So community engagement, that's the next sort of um, piece of the process. And this is, so, this is especially in cases where you are wanting to acquire city land, which we will talk more about that acquisition process in a moment. But if there's like a vacant lot in your neighborhood, I saw someone mention something about Greenwood Street. Let's say there's a, you know, a lot on Greenwood Street. Great, Renee. Um, and I will come back to that comment later. Um, that there's a lot in Greenwood Street and um, it's not, you know, there's no other process happening and it's a good site for a garden and you want to put a garden there. Well, we would, and then you came and you came and talked to me or somebody, you know, somebody else at D&D about it. What we would say to you is, you know, it would, please start talking to the neighbors and the abutters. And um, that's sort of on the, the, whoever wants to develop the garden, that's that's like on you. Um, not meaning that we, we do then come in and do a community meeting, but the first step is for you to, you know, sort of build that support. Um, there are times when we come to a neighborhood, and actually we have done this around Greenwood Street um, recently, relatively recently, um, where we have multiple ideas or like multiple possibilities we're thinking for a site, and we sort of come out and present, you know, a bunch of ideas and then get people's input. Um, but but most of the time, we 
wait to come out to do a, a formal meeting until we already know there's some interest in a certain use for a site. Um, and again, that's really about trying to, you know, there's tons of meetings that happen in every neighborhood and we try to just be efficient with the city resources and efficient with your time. Um, so neighborhood associations are also really good to talk to because we always talk with neighborhood associations about, you know, wanting to know if they're in support of an idea as well. Um, oh, and then actually I'll say one more thing about the community meetings. So we, um, we, when we hold those community meetings, that's, we hold those because we have to do what's called uh, it's um, called an open and competitive RFP process. And that's part of chapter 30B, you'll see that on the next slide, which is some anti-corruption laws that got, or an anti-corruption law that got established in the nineties so that I can't just like, you know, my best friend wants to start, wants to want some land and I can just give it to them without ever anybody else having a chance, right? So we have to hold this competitive process and part of that process that we, one of our practices that we do in that process is to hold a community meeting. And that really, that uh, the biggest piece of why that's beneficial isn't really about the, the, pro, the, the, the anti-corruption piece, it's really more about, we wanna know that the community is in support. Like we don't want to um, come in and say, we've decided without your input, <laughs> we've decided this should be a garden or we've decided this should be a house. And so, we try to come out and get feedback and make sure that, you know, as we've been told, it is something that's being supported. Um, are there any questions specifically on community engagement before I move on? You, uh, there's one from Jay, do you see that? Let me open it up. It's, uh, he said, he asked, is there a benefit to being an, an established nonprofit, new nonprofit, small business when applying for city land to grow? Um, yes, there is a benefit, which is, Oh, I see versus versus. Okay. So being a nonprofit is an advantage because you can access funds. The funds that we have available, which I will talk about next after land acquisition, are really only available to 501c3 organizations. Um, you can, it, it's theoretically possible that a business could start a garden. Um, certainly if you started a farm, you know, there's, there's possibilities for having like a fiscal agent, a nonprofit fiscal agent but it has to really be for the, the purpose, the use of the land has to really be for a public purpose, a public benefit, not for private profit. So that's the, that's the really key distinction. Um, so in terms, of, you know, in terms of applying for the land, it is beneficial to be an established entity of some kind um, because when we're, when we're thinking about, you know, when we're putting this land back into private ownership, even though it's gonna be for public use, um, but you know, not not public city ownership. We want to make sure that it's going to be well taken care of and that it's going to be there for a long time. And so, if it's just you know one or two individuals who want to start a garden or a farm or something, um, we we would be hesitant to sell the land to them because even if they're very enthusiastic, because what if they decide to move away or like in 50 years they passed on and then we don't know what's going to happen to the garden. So we try. We really do try to we try to be very responsible with these city assets and have um entities purchase them who have some kind of sort of institutional structure and it's even better if they've been around for a while but we do have new organizations that have been acquiring land in recent years and so it's not it's not a requirement that it be around a long time but it has to be usually needs to be sort of um like clearly a group effort so that there is not just, it's not just counting on one or two people staying committed to make it happen. Um, and then I saw that Renee, you're, yeah, that, green, that Greenwood parcel, um, I love the idea of there being a food forest there. And I am uh, in conversation with Marilyn Foreman about the, we've been talking some about like the visioning process for that site. So if you're, if you're interested in that, I'm gonna have my contact information at the end, please, feel free to reach out to me about it. Was it Renee that asked that question or someone else? Yes, it was you. Yeah, so um, I would love to talk with you about that Greenwood parcel. We, we know the community is interested in having it be open space, so that's why nothing's happening on it right now. Yeah, <laughs> but we didn't have a specific, we hadn't heard a specific vision yet. Um, okay, so land acquisition. Actually, let me just drink a little water. So land acquisition. As I mentioned before, we have this, these 30B regulations, and so we have to do a request for proposals. 
which is basically we we have this document that we release publicly and there's like a month or sometimes in COVID there has been a little bit longer time some of the some of the part proposals right now we're back to 30 days um but 30 days you have to respond and it basically lays out like um you know tell there's evaluation criteria that you have to basically show how you fit these criteria and how you will respond to these criteria. So for example, some of them are about diversity, some of them are about financial and administrative capacity, some of them are about um, meeting the objectives of the community. So when we have community meetings, we wait for, we, what we part of what we come out of those meetings with is a sense of what the community wants to see. So Sometimes community members will say, we, you know, I, this hasn't actually happened, but they could say, we don't want fruit trees, um, or we want, we want raised beds that everyone's going to grow in, or they might say, we do want a greenhouse, or we don't want a greenhouse, or we don't want bees. So there's like things that we really, we list very specifically in the RFP that then respondents, people who submit proposals have to uh, respond to and so they have to address they, they, we, we need, they need to show how they're going to meet those objectives that the community has laid out in addition to the more general criteria of like showing that they're responsible and can take care of it and all of that so the request for proposals gets issued once we know that the community is in support of a certain use of the land and then when we issue that request for proposals we get a proposal back or multiple proposals we oftentimes get only one for an open space project, but some, but it's possible we could get more than one. And then we have an internal process that where we look at those evaluation criteria that we've laid out, you know, very publicly and clearly in the RFP, and we compare, we we rank, rank rate is a better word. We rate the proposals against those criteria. So if we have multiple proposals, whoever has the highest score is then going to be the the um, recommended developer. Now, like I said, we usually, we very often only get one proposal for an open space project. So when we get that one, um, we still do that process. We do rate, you know, we wanna make sure that they're meeting a certain standard. And then the next step is that we take that recommendation to the Public Facilities Commission. The Public Facilities Commission in Boston is who determines whether or not we can sell land. So a certain, like a certain parcel to a certain organization. So there's a two vote process that happens to make that happen, to get to where we're closing on the sale of the land. And the first one is called tentative designation. And these are not that important to remember, but I just wanted to sort of lay out the process. So you, you know, we, we bring the, and I'm about to do this for next month's meeting, public facilities commission meeting. I, I submit a package and I say, the, you know, these people wanna, this organization wants to buy this land and build this garden. And then I present that to the committee um, I mean, the commission, excuse me, and they say they vote yes or no. Um, and if they vote yes, then that means that developer of the garden, which can be a you know, small grassroots gardening organization, is then um, called the tentative developer and they are, um, they have a year to finalize plans, designs, financing, um, and the budget. And if they're doing anything like building a greenhouse or something there if there's permitting required they need you know they might need to do that but um so they have that year but sometimes people can you can do it as quickly as in two months if, if everything's already final when you submit your proposal then um it can be as early as two months later that we can uh go back to the commission and we have to do what's called a conveyance vote and that's the the first one is like an intent to sell the second one is yes we're definitely selling they're ready to go we're selling this land we sell the land for $100 a parcel. So it's not, the land itself is not expensive, um, but it can be expensive to develop a new garden. So that's what we'll talk about funding opportunities in a moment, especially if you are putting in a water connection. That's, that's a big part of the cost. And this process usually takes, I would say from someone having like a, an idea um, of putting a garden on a certain site, um, it can take anywhere from 12 to 18 months to get to where that garden is built and up and running because of these different, because of the community engagement that has to happen and then the meeting we have to have and the RFP and then the two different votes and the finishing of the design and all of that. It can happen faster. There's a site in um, Dorchester where they're doing a healing forest. And I think from like their first inquiry to, well, probably even that one though, it went pretty quickly, but even with that one, I think it won't be built for, it'll probably be like 16 months from when they first reached out to us. To when it's built so it usually takes over a year and that's i think an important thing to know at the beginning is that if you call me with a new idea tomorrow 
you're pro you're not going to have a garden this summer, but it's a, a very worthwhile effort, I think. And this last website is a site where you can go and see some of the land that's available in the D and D inventory. Um, and if there are other parcels, and I'm um, working to figure out ways to get that to those other parcels. We just switched websites, and we're still working out some of the kinks in the website. But um, but a lot of the land that's available is there. And then if you know of a parcel and you want to know whether it's possible to put a garden there, you should definitely reach out to me um, or to D and D in general and find out. You know, they can let you know. We can let you know if it is a possibility or not. Are there any questions on this part of the on this process, the public land? Not look in the look in the chat too. Oh, this is something else. Okay. Um, all right, if there aren't any questions on that, I will move on. So funding opportunities. These are some of the funding opportunities, the, the kind of the biggest funding, the main funding opportunities I'm aware of with the city. Um, if other folks know of other funding resources for gardens, I welcome you to put those in the chat for people. Um, so the grassroots program has gives funding directly from the resources that we have in two ways. One is when we sell land, we can often offer funding to build a garden or another or another open space project um, while the, to offer funding along with the land. So in the RFP, we will say this land is available for $100 a parcel and up to $100,000 is funding. A funding is available to build this garden. And that money is only available for 501c3 organizations. And it's only available to be spent on capital funds, which is really about <clears throat> Building, building stuff. <laughs> that's the that's what capital funds are: building stuff and renovating. But in this case, because you would be, you know, sort of starting something new on a on a piece of land, building a garden. And I'll go into more detail on that capital thing, just in case folks don't really understand what that means. That took me a really long time to learn um, when I first heard of that concept. So uh, the other thing to know is that we can only fund gardens um, through grassroots in low to moderate income neighborhoods. And we do that. We figure out what that you know in terms of. That, that's based on the US census numbers. So um, we have a system, we have a tool internally that we use to check you know, a certain radius of a site. So that's another thing that if you're thinking about putting in a garden and it's in like Roslindale or West Roxbury and you're not sure if it, we, it would be eligible, um, that's a, you can reach out to me and that's part of what I do is look that up for people. Then in addition to if you're you know, acquiring city land, if you're not acquiring city land, but you have land of your own or um, other public land, like land at a library or a school that you'd like to put a community garden on. We have now live as of, I think, January, a grassroots funding RFP. So you can apply. It's basically requesting for requesting for proposals for capital improvements or creation of gardens and other open spaces on land that is not DND land. So it can be city owned. It can be public. It can be like state owned. Um, and uh, or it can be privately owned. So it can be like an organization's land or even an individual's land, as long as it's going to be publicly available. And there needs to be some, um, it needs to be clear that it will be permanently a public benefit. With, that money is available for up to, I mean, it's up to $100,000 that's available. And it is also for capital funds only and only for available to 501c3 organizations. And um, again, that's something where, you know, you can partner with the 501c3 um, it, you know, it doesn't, it doesn't have to be the only a 501c3 is involved, but a 501c3 has to receive the money. And, um, and that can be for creation or renovation of open space projects. And again, that money is also, it's the same source as the land, the money we issue with land. So it's also uh, it needs to be in a low to moderate income neighborhood. Um, we also have, we'll have soon have some funding available through the Mayor's Youth Council. It's a total of, of about $333,000. Um, the Youth Council about a year and a half ago voted to prioritize urban agriculture. And um, so they're, and I, I didn't put this in the bullets here, but they're wanting to fund new gardens or expanded gardens or farms. And the programming needs to be somewhat youth-centered and definitely the food access needs to be youth-centered. I mean, like. The way they described it to me is that a teenager needs to be able to walk up to the site and get free food. And these, um, these sites need to be on city land and they need to be in Roxbury, Dorchester, or Mattapan. So if you're interested in starting a garden in Roxbury, Dorchester, or Mattapan, 
this might be a good source of funding um, that could be available through that process, um, th through this grant. And this, I think it will be, it should be available by the summer at the latest, if not late spring. Um, and then um, CPA, Community Preservation Act, I should have spelled it out, is another source of funding for open space projects that folks may have heard of, but maybe not. And that's money that comes in through a, a very small tax that we all pay um, that funds preservation of open space, affordable housing, and historic, um, historic preservation. And we work very closely with CPA and people often submit proposals to CPA in their annual cycle for projects on land that is currently in our inventory that we're in the process of trying to sell. Um, so that's, uh, that's another source that's possible. And they often are able to do really significant amounts of money. I mean, th those grants are oftentimes as much as like $100,000, not always, but oftentimes. Okay, any questions so far on the money aspect of things? Um, <clears throat> I included a, a link to the New England Grassroots Environmental Fund. That's a fund you don't need to be a 501c3, but it's a, a, a lot smaller amount of money. Mm -hmm. Sometimes projects only need a little bit amount of money, right? So that's great. Um, so then just for folks, if, if, in case you're not familiar with the concept of capital funds, I just made sort of a brainstorm of some of the things that capital funds can be used for. Um, it's really to, it's not for maintenance, it's not for ongoing repairs. It's really to like make a significant investment in, in the physical, um, the physical aspect of the site of the garden. Um, so it can be walkways, water, um, raising, you know, expanding the garden, um, improving, you know, you have like a shed that's falling apart, you want to build a new shed, that kind of thing. And of course, building a brand new garden definitely counts. Um, okay, here's just a couple of examples of gardens that we um, have funded. And I would I, there I, there are, there are many. We've done a lot of these. I mean, this grassroots open space program has been around. Whoops, I went too fast. I clicked too many times. Oh no, I did. I pressed. I must have held it down or something. It it got uh, it went autopilot on me. Let's see if I can back it up. Um, okay, we'll catch back up again. Um, so what was I saying? Oh yeah, there, so there's a couple of gardens that I'm gonna talk about that are, one is an example of a garden we helped create and another is an example of a garden that we did a small improvement. It was actually a trustees of renovation, trustees of reservations garden. Um, give me one second. Here we go, okay. So Folsom Street Garden is a garden in um, Roxbury. I always go back and forth in my mind, whether it's in Roxbury, Dorchester, <laughs> it's right on the border. And, um, Neighbors wanted to start a new garden and it was part of a visioning process that was happening around food justice in that neighborhood. And we sold that land to Dudley Neighbors Incorporated to go into their land trust, their open space land trust. And then the garden itself is operated by the Folsom Street Garden Committee. And we, we were able to help do some capital improvements. Choice funding also is sometimes a source of funding through grassroots, um, especially over the years. It's another federal funding source. <coughs> um, and then we did some capital improvements beyond that. So that was where there was like funding associated with sale of the land. So that land is now, like I said, owned by the land trust and will be held as open space permanently. We put um, deed restrictions on the land that we sell for open space. So for, for hopefully as long as, you know, as long as Dorchester exists, that will be there or Roxbury, depending on your opinion. Um, then... Leland Community Garden is a trustees of reservation garden. And this one was, this is a very well established, gorgeous, huge garden. And they applied to a funding RFP similar to the one we have now. The one we have now is like a rolling funding opportunity. Um, this one was a one time, it had a deadline. It was two years ago, which is hard to believe because it's like, it doesn't seem like that long ago. But um, we offered this funding and they, they applied and got some money to build a sun shelter, which I keep meaning to get a new picture because it's missing a key piece of it at the top. But um, this this went in at the Leland Community Garden, and um, we were able to make that you know permanent physical improvement with the grassroots funding that we have. And that is everything I wanted to share, and I would love to take questions.
if there are any, maybe there aren't any, and we'll have a very short, quiet workshop. <laughs> Go back and see if I missed anything up there. Any questions or any um, thoughts, any additional information folks wanna share? I didn't know I would go get, get through it so quickly, but I did. Alice, did you have a question? Yes. Great. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, good. So my question is, um, it assumes, I'm assuming that most of these parcels that are potential community gardens, you'd have to be a 501c3 or have a fiscal agent. And once you, take about a year to get the garden, got to have a water source. Does that land become the property of the city or do you, does the city prefer to give it to another organization? Um, sorry, I was trying to move you so I can look up at you and not down. Um, <laughs> um, so I'm sorry, you said, does it become, when we, if you apply, if a 501c3 applies for applies to, to build a garden, does it does the land go to the 501c3? Was that your question? Um, kind of. I'm okay, I'm sorry. Of, Can you just repeat? Because I was having my technical okay, problem. Sure. <laughs> Me too. Um, so I love the idea that there can be more community gardens and that your office helps support it. But if anybody, say a neighbor wanted to start one and they know it's going to take a year, they know that they need a water source, they know that they need to get community input and outreach, does the land itself stay in the city or does the city hmm. try to get it to another organization? Right, yeah, so we don't want to manage community gardens. At this point, the city doesn't have that capacity and so that's not our preference. We do have some sites that are operating under license, right, already and, um, that where we, you know, we know we, there's like a really good program going on, but maybe the organization that's doing it doesn't have clear capacity to hold on to land permanently or take care of land permanently, but we want to support the work they're doing and they provide an important, um, uh, an important resource to the community. So there are occasionally situations like that, but we try to avoid that. What we prefer to do is help there, help there be a process for it to go into the hands of an organization. And sometimes that can be a neighborhood association. Like it doesn't have to be a gardening organization necessarily. Um, we have several projects where a very local group of like homeowners and residents um, who, you know, where it's like, there's like a very clear, like a strong investment in the community and like people who've been around a while and an, and an entity, like a, you know, a board that's like taking care of it or a committee or something. Um, we can, we, you know, if that organization has some sort of institutional, like is some kind of legal entity, we can, we can, and we have sold land to organizations like that. Um, they don't have to be gardening focused necessarily. Um, so, I mean, yeah, I think if, a, if an individual neighbor wants to start a community garden, we, we're more hesitant to sell the land to that neighbor for the purposes of like a public benefit. Because again, if that person moves to Florida, we don't know that there's any, there's no, there's no sort of structure to that land to live um, that we can count on um, or at least somewhat count on. So um, that's why it's usually institutions, but yeah, we definitely do, do not prefer to keep it. Thank you. There are two raised hands. Yeah, I saw Kelly had a question. Hi. Hi. Um, I was wondering what kind of problems do you run into? Like, do you, uh, sometimes find um, neighbors who don't want this kind of thing near them, or are there other sorts of um, issues and conflicts that, that you run into on a semi-regular basis? It's a great question. Um, it's pretty, I found so far in my time doing this work that it's not that common for people to be concerned about a garden just as a garden. There's a, occasionally there's concerns about like, there's a, there's a site that we sold last year that um, is gonna be a wildlife habitat garden instead of a food producing garden because they were worried about pests because that site has a history of a lot of pests. And it's a big site and they know that they don't have the capacity to sort of keep up with it enough as the neighbors, as the community members to keep it from um, getting, you know, being a, being a pest encouraging situation. Um, 
but I would say the bigger, we do hear concerns about bees. That's one thing we hear concerns about. And sometimes that's resolved by, you know, some, you know, the butter would like a fence and that's all they want and that's fine. And that's happening at one of the projects that's in the process now. Um, and sometimes it means that the bees, there can't be bees there. Um, so that, I think those are the two things that most often happen. I, I mostly we hear, we get a lot of support. Like people are really excited about food being grown in their neighborhood most of the time, which makes me really happy. <laughs> um, I think the only other, the other big challenge that we come across is the question of sort of the capacity of a group to take it on permanently. So like I was saying before, if it's, you know, just a few people who want to start something, it's hard for us just to sort of go full force into that process without helping them pair up with like a land trust or a local neighborhood association or something like that. So I think those are probably the biggest ones that we come across. We've had, we have had some kind of big resistance before to urban farming sites where it's a little bit bigger scale. Um, but even that, I would say out of the multiple farming sites that I've seen go live in the last couple of years, there was only really one that had significant resistance. Um, and that, and that was, seemed like it was, the project still went forward because it seemed like there was some um, sort of personal conflict that was clouding the situation, you know, that wasn't really about the farm. Um, so is that, does that answer your question, Kelly? It does. Great. Thank you. You're welcome. Jay? Oh, uh, yes. Uh, thanks for taking my, my question. Totally. Um, so uh, just kind of like a little bit of context and then um, kind of a general to hopefully specific question. Um, so I'm, I was recently hired um, at Haley House to manage uh, the McKinley School Gardens, which is just kind of adjacent to where Haley House is. Mm -hmm. And as I listen, I'm just thinking about sort of ideas of, um, you know, what are my parameters within sort of city city opportunities, whether you know if I'm looking for um, like new infrastructure of you know seating areas or you know trying to you know have like mulch all over the beds, you know, um, are those opportunities that I could look for because because it's it's already an established site or is it because it's already established site I'm kind of not um, looking in the right in the right place for funding. No, you can. Yeah, you definitely can. And um, certainly, the, the mulch is is a little more questionable because you, you sort of have to replace mulch pretty often. But the but benches, seating areas, that's definitely something we fund. Um, that's something that can be you know permanent or at least very long term. And so we the rolling funding RFP that I mentioned, um, which can be found if you go to boss. I can type this in the chat, but it's Boston.gov/dnd/rfps. And there's um, yeah. grassroots funding RFP. And that one is the one you would apply to for like a capital improvement like you're describing. And that does not have to be, you, as long as you have, um, who, who owns the land that the McKinley Gardens are on? So it's a school, okay. um, but um, right. Haley House is sort of contracted to- Yeah, kind of so it would it need to be- and, you need and provide programming and whatnot, yeah. Right, sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt you. Yeah, so, um, oh. You would just need to submit like a letter from the school saying, you know, that yes, this can be a, this can, you know, this improvement can happen and um, the garden will be here permanently or, you know, for the whatever, like whatever they're committed to for the hell on the garden will be there. Okay. Okay. Great. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. There's another question from Ren, uh, from Renee in the great. chat. Could you read it, Fred? Sure. Uh, I really like. The teen program, there are really two areas open near Greenwood. We have a water connection already. I was out today getting our area for um, compost drop off and had six people who want to garden, but our space is full. Mm. Some have asked about the plot next door, just doing nothing but collecting trash from people walking down the street. Is it a possibility? Yeah, it's totally a possibility. Um, I think when we last, when I was last talking with folks in the neighborhood, um, probably it's probably been a year, at least a year, because it was definitely before the pandemic. Um, we we've gotten the impression that there wasn't demand for a garden expansion, but I, there has been a lot of increase in demand for garden expansion this year. <laughs> so I think the main thing would be to talk with your neighborhood association and also um, 
you know, get names of gardeners who are people who are interested in gardening and then be in touch with me or Marilyn Foreman. Um, I believe she lives, I think she's part of the neighborhood association or she lives nearby. She's definitely been as part of the Codman Square in DC, helping me think about helping me sort of move these things along in that area. And um, even though I know it's four corners, um, but so she, she's a good person to talk to because she's been in conversation with me, but you can also just reach out to me directly. And um, it's definitely a possibility. We, we, we know, and we have it like sort of marked in our list as you know, the community wants open space. And um, so it's, if you and other neighbors are excited about expanding it as a garden, then you should definitely sort of organize a way to communicate that information um, to us and we'll, we can move it along. That'd be great. Great. Other questions or comments? Would you like to put up your contact again? Yeah, I have that next. I can put it right here. Okay. Absolutely. Um, yeah, I'm always happy. I mean, this is my full-time job and it's been a while since DND has been able to have a full-time person on this pro program. So I've been trying to move a lot of things, move a lot of projects forward. And I'm, I'm always excited to hear about um, you know, new sites or that you're interested in, you know, working on. And you can also always be in touch with me if there's, um, if there's uh, something that you want to, like an improvement, like Jay was just asking me about, is this, a, does this sort of improvement, is it eligible for the funding RFP? You can, you can always reach out to me about that too, and I can help you figure that out. Jay asked if you could put the link up that you mentioned. Yep, absolutely. And uh, in the ch chat is uh, all sorts of links from the trustees about other information and uh, surveys and uh, future projects. So if you wanna save the chat later. Sorry, I didn't mean to do that. I was trying to get the actual, um the HTTPS link of that, but I'll just put it, there we go. Um, I'll just type it in regular. There you go. So Shaney, I do have a question. Yeah, absolutely. Are you the only person in the neighborhood office that would be the contact for this? Is it all Yes, right now office? I am. Wow, thank you. Yeah, I'm a one woman program at the moment. <laughs> <laughs> other folks help me out where possible and I have when I have community meetings there's other other folks in my division that come but most of the department works on affordable housing and I, I do almost completely open space the good stuff yeah thank you thank <laughs> yeah you for the hard work oh, you're welcome <laughs> I'm very passionate about it I'm a community gardener myself I'm a former urban farmer so this is like right up my alley hooray thank you so mm -hmm. much yeah and I can hang out a little while if other folks think of questions, but I don't know what the policy is, Fred. I didn't know we'd be done so early. I didn't know I would, I don't know. I didn't know it'd be done so early. <laughs> but that's that's everything I had to say. So that's how it goes. Okay, so um, we, we can end, end the session or we can hang out here. Uh, well, folks you're here. Go if, they're, if, they're, um, if they don't have any questions, but if anybody wants to talk about anything else gardening related or city related, um, I'm happy to stick around for a little while. It seems like folks are mostly maybe having dinner while they do this or something. Um, this is, this <laughs> yeah, is really Jay. I, I, I do have another question. I don't want Great. to take up too much um, space, but um, I'm, I am curious about the um, the Boston Youth Council that you, you mentioned um, and, and how there's like funding there and opportunities and, um, and if you kind of grow food and you, you make it available, that's, you, you, you qualify? Or something. So I'm just trying to get my head around that. And Talk a little more about that one. Yeah. So the um, the main way that we will make that funding available will be with disposition of land because it needs to be on city land okay. and needs to exist for like five years. So it, we can we can sell the land. It needs to be on land that is currently in the city's inventory. Um, so that's one where there's not, the money's not for like improvements. It's for like on other people's land and or, or organizations land. So, but your project is, a, is Boston Public Schools. So if it was gonna be 
Um, if you had, I mean, I'm imagining that you don't actually have extra space there in the South End or in um, Roxbury, yeah. but um, but if you did have extra space and you wanted to expand it, that would be a possible funding source. Um, um, but most we're expecting it's mostly going to be that like someone's, you know, like the Greenwood, like say there's a Greenwood Community Garden expansion and they're going to, you know, offer free food to youth. Um, then we then we could issue if we knew that that was part of the plan for the use of the space, we could issue, we could, we could um, include in the RFP that funding availability. Uh, so it's it's not like established programming that could exist. So if, because like right now there's, there's a lot of um, room for like new ideas and what this garden can look like. Um, so if part of the programming that is created is around just, you know, access for, you know, youth and food is that something that i could well we can't it can't doesn't it, it's also i'm not sure if i put this on the slide but it is also limited to capital funds oh, okay. coming out of the city's capital budget so it's not it can't fund programming uh, okay if you were if you were to expand the garden and then add youth programming that that would count towards the sort of youth focus mm -hmm. that would allow us to fund it, the expansion but we could only what we could pay for would be the actual building of the new site the new plots I see. I see. Okay. So nothing. I got it. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, totally. And Kelly, if you could lower your hand, so I don't wonder if you have another question, that would be great. And then if you do have a new question, you can definitely raise it. Um, okay. Any other, oh, that's great. Um, any other questions? Is it bad form, Fred, to end 20 minutes early or is it no. okay? Okay. Yeah, great. that's good. We can go okay. have dinner. Okay, sounds good. Thanks everyone for coming. It's great to have you here and thanks for the questions. Thank you, Shana, I really appreciate it. Yeah. Yes, thank you, Shana. Yep. Thank Talk you so much. You. Bye. Bye-bye.